Hello, listeners. This is Ken. Welcome back to Put Your Hands Up Podfix. This will be the continuation of Prodigal. This will be Part 3, Chapter 3, entitled Mondays Were Not Made for This. Shota had a thing against Mondays. After they had dropped the hell class back at the dorms, both he and Hazashi had been called out on a mission that had lasted most of the weekend, which meant that the rest he should have gotten was non-existent. Ergo, his despise for the first day of the school week mounted. Understandable to most people, but his partner seemed to not give a care and woke up at the break of dawn. He would pull back the blinds, yawn in a horribly loud cadence, and then rise to take care of his cats and make breakfast. This, of course, would result in Shota waking up in the next room with a groan and cursing the fact that his friend was an early riser. As they were eating breakfast, Hizashi exclaimed around his food, Did you see the letter that was on the floor? Piqued interest, Shota looked up from his computer. What? I don't know when it got there, but I saw it when we brought our stuff back last night. I assume it was slipped under the door. It had your name on it. Confusion manifested, and his brows furrowed. Hizashi plowed on. I assumed you'd read it. I left it on the coffee table. Showed aside, taking a long swig of his coffee. I'm sure it's not incredibly important. Someone would have texted me. I'll read it before dinner. That seemed to satisfy his partner, and Hizashi went back to cooing over their cats and eating his eggs. Showed a smile softly and turned back to his work. He hoped he could finish his report before he had to go wrangle the gaggle of disaster children that made up 2A. Teaching his hell class was not actually something that gave him migraines. He would never admit it, but he had grown disgustingly fond of them. And the only good thing about Mondays was that he got to make sure none of them had died or dropped off the face of the earth. He rolled his shoulders back as he entered the room, the telltale sounds of Mina socking Minetta across the jaw, making him preen. His miniature smirk disappeared the moment he laid eyes on Midoriya's empty seat. Any form of warm affection dissipated entirely when his gaze strayed to Bakugo. The normally explosive blonde was quiet. It was so disturbing that Shota stopped halfway to the podium. Those crimson eyes glanced back toward the empty desk behind him. Shota had been trained to observe things that most people would overlook. It was part of being an efficient underground hero. He had noticed the change that had been developing in Bakugo, but this quiet was different. It was wrong. And so was the absent desk behind him. Morning, Sensei. Yayorozu, ever the polite pupil, greeted him. She seemed not to notice his confusion. He spared a curt nod. Bakugo's eyes finally caught on his, on their way back from glancing toward Midoriya's seat. They froze for a moment, ebony gaze boring into crimson. There was no anger in the boy's eyes, only the look of someone who had lost something precious. Something was very, very wrong. Has anyone seen Midoriya? Mina's voice carried over the murmurs. The jumble of noise quieted, and everyone's gaze moved to the empty desk. The mood in the room immediately dropped. I saw him Friday. Todoroki's low tone carried worry, something that if the situation was not, growing more concerned by the second, Shota would have been delighted with. The dual quirked boy had become so much more open with his emotions since being with this class. He only wished such a display was not unearthed because of Midori's absence. He wasn't with us at the mall, though, Kirishima pointed out. Aizawa was well aware. Yagi himself had informed him that Izuku was going to be missing from the getaway for reasons that Nezu had approved. While he was more than suspicious, he knew of the relationship between the retired pro and his student, though he was in the dark about its specifics. He had seen how far All Might would go to protect the problem child, and had not questioned it. Perhaps that was his mistake. But he was at dinner and movie night yesterday, right? Denki's brows furrowed. He glanced around at his classmates. They all seemed to be in the same state of confusion. Was he? Buraraka's pitch raised with hesitation. Because dinner was absent of Deku's usual compliments to the chef. Ida hummed thoughtfully, hand slicing through the air. Buraraka is correct. Midoriya always compliments Bakugo's Sunday evening cooking. This statement drew Shota's gaze back to the scarily quiet blonde. Bakugo's hands had fisted on his desk. They were shaking. He knew something. Okay. Did anyone see him at all this weekend? There was a slowly building panic within the class at Saro's question. No one responded. Bakugo's head fell even further into his chest. Shota was, mildly putting it, perturbed. One of his students, definitely the one that had caused him the most problems yet also grown on him the most, was apparently missing, right under his nose. Oh, someone was going to die. He knew better than to try and interrogate Bakugo in front of the whole class. His and Midoriya's history was a complicated one, and while both admitted that it was far better than it once was, he could not rule out the possibility of the Viridian-haired boy's disappearance being the cause of Bakugo's actions. However, Shota was a pro-hero. He knew which battles to fight in the audience of others. That was not one of them. I'm sure there's a very logical explanation for the problem child's absence. Settle down. 
We're already late. The class did as they were told, albeit with worried glances cast between them. Shota forced himself to remain calm, like he always was, and wrangle his hell class into submission. Within a half hour, the glances toward Midoriya's empty desk stopped, and his students seemed perfectly distracted. All but Bakugo, who did not say a single word. The bell rang and showed aside. Remember to edit your papers before you turn them in tomorrow. I don't want another case of lyrics in the margins as delightful as they were. He raised a brow at Jiro, who ducked her head but smirked. The class filed out, but before Bakugo could disappear among the crowd, the pro called out his name. Stay behind. I want to talk to you about your training exercise on Thursday. Bakugo Kotsky was a very intelligent kid. He knew that the conversation would have nothing to do with the new move he had been working on during Thursday's training. He swallowed, jerking his head toward Kirishima, who saluted before linking his arm through Kaminari's and racing down the hall. The class dissipated down the corridor, leaving the teacher and the student alone. Bakugo sat back in his chair, the picture of disgruntled annoyance. His shoulders were squared, and his jaw was tight. He crossed his arms and raised a brow. However, his eyes betrayed him. Even with this charade, the same trepidation remained. Where is Midoriya? The question did not surprise the explosive teen. He glared. Why should I care what the stupid nerd is? Show it aside. You're not a good actor, Bakugo. Underground hero work will never be for you. Now, what do you know? The pretense disappeared as quickly as it had arisen. Bakugo's shoulders sagged, and his head whipped to the window. The tightness in his jaw warped into grief. Red flags arose, and alarms went off inside Shota's head. Bakugo Kotsky, if one of my students has disappeared, I need to know. If Midori is in danger and you withheld information, you will be expelled. I can't tell you, he snapped, but the anger deferred from his usual brashness. This was darker and deeper. I... I wish I fucking could, okay? God, I... He swallowed, flexing his hands. Shota waited for an explosion. It did not come. I wish I could. If anyone could do something. Bakugo sighed heavily. But I can't. I promised the nerd that I wouldn't. Shota relaxed by an inch. So, you've seen him. Bakugo nodded, hooded crimson meeting ebony. Was it Friday? Saturday? When, Bakugo? Sensei. Bakugo. His tone turned harsh. Sue him. His problem child was gone. Midoriya is my student. No, he's not. The blonde scowled, volume shooting upward. Not anymore. Not after that. But he stopped himself before he could say anything, slapping a hand over his mouth. Showed his gut twisted. Bakugo, for whatever reason, knew where Midoriya was and why he was missing, but had promised not to tell him. Something had happened to Midoriya. Not my student, he repeated slowly. Bakugo, what does that mean? And he could tell. He could see just how much his student wanted to tell him everything. But Shota knew better. He knew how loyal Bakuga was, even if he would never say it. He could already see the guilt in his eyes that, having divulged this much, he would not get anything else out of the boy. Go ask the rat, Bakuga hissed. Shota blinked. Nezu? Nezu knows about this. The blonde, sensing that his involvement in the current stage of Shota's inquiry was ending, stood and slung his bag over his shoulder. I wouldn't trust a thing he says, though. Bakugo. Something in Shota's voice made him pause. The kid did not turn back to look at him, but his head tilted just enough to indicate he was listening. Is he safe? Please give me this. Kotsky's shoulders fell again. I don't know. Any peace he was hoping to receive from the admission turned to dust. His stomach flipped as his student trudged out the door, taking vital information with him. Shota steeled himself and let out a shaky breath. Something had happened over the weekend to one of his students that had resulted in his disappearance, and no one had informed Shota of anything. He was completely in the dark. Even Bakugo's information barely led to any deciphering of the situation. Someone had messed with one, possibly two, of his kids, and no one had told him. His worry was beginning to mix with a wave of rising anger. He glanced at his watch, and as it would be in his office. Without a second's hesitation, he sprinted from the room and toward the animal's lounge. He needed answers. Fear mounted with each step, it seemed. Why was Midoriya gone? What caused his disappearance? Bakugo was not torn up enough yet for it to be a kidnapping he had been involved in, and if Midori had been killed, surely the staff would have been notified. If something had happened while Yagi had been present, then the man would be raging and roaring about his boy to everyone until he was saved or avenged or whatever retribution. So, where was he? He threw open the door without knocking. Where is my problem, child? Nezu, to his credit, did not flinch. He also probably saw Shota coming. Ah, Aizawa, please sit. He did not. 
Where is my student, Nezu? The rodent hummed, clasping his paws together. Midoriya is no longer a student of UA. The knowledge was about as effective as a kick to Shota's chest and hurt even more. He had hoped that Bakugo had simply misread the situation or that Midori was, for some reason, sick, pulling the wool over their eyes. Having the information confirmed made him want to hurl. Midori Izuku was one of his greatest students. The amount of growth and progress that Shota had witnessed in the kid was more than any other kid he had taught. He had gone from a boy who could not wield his quirk without breaking his fingers to a young man with the most potential to be a hero that he had ever seen. He was good, not just at saving people or stopping villains, but just plain good. There were so few people left who could see the beautiful things in life when their vision was clouded, so little true happiness and righteous intent, but Midoriya had it. He could see the light at the end of the tunnel. He could find reasons to smile. He was the best of them all. Why? The word filled the room like the hiss of a wounded snake. Nezu shook his head. That information is classified, Aizawa. I'm his teacher. And Midori has allowed some privacy, Shoda. The false cheerfulness made his snarl surface. I have reason to believe that this was not just some drop-of-the-hat decision, Nezu. Shoda stepped closer, growl festering in the back of his throat. And I find it hard to believe that Midori would ever leave UA voluntarily. Well, then it's a good thing that your job is not in admissions, hmm? The principal narrowed his eyes threateningly. Midori is no longer your concern. My concern? He scowled. His students would always be his concern. When they were grown and gone, pro-heroes in their own right, lives and marriages and kids of their own, they would still be his concern, his problem, his privilege. He would always worry and fret and grumble about them in his own fond way. What else would one expect after being in so many deadly situations? He had gotten attached, damn it all, and now one of his fold was missing. They're just students, Aizawa. I let you continue teaching them despite their graduating to the next grade because they work so well under your tutelage. But they're not your children. At this, Nezu paused. He glanced over at the teacher, took in his stiff stance and frantic gaze. A short breath that could have been called a laugh pierced the air. Don't tell me you've... You were his teacher, Shoda. The next sentence almost made Shoda throw himself across the desk at the animal. Not his father. He wanted to snap and say that he was as good as. He wanted to scream that those kids were his in any way that he could have them. He wanted to shout that he was so happy to have this class, this group of troublemakers and rabble-rousers and misfits. He would give his life for each of them. He would sacrifice to protect Mina's laugh, Todoroki's soft smiles, Shoji's dry sense of humor. He would risk everything for them. They were his. Midori Izuku was his, and now he was gone, and Shota could hardly breathe. Weren't you going to expel him last year anyway? Shota's gaze snapped up to his superiors. What? Your test that you give at the beginning of each new school year. You expelled the whole lot of them a few years ago. Midoriya was surely on your list of problems that you would be happy to be rid of. For a moment he wondered if that was what Midoriya felt he was. A burden that Aizawa dealt with because he had to. The horror he felt from such thoughts twisted into fury. None of my students are problems. They're kids. Heroes in the making, Nezu corrected, raising a paw. Young Midoriya could not handle the stress that came with such a charge. He has resigned his position from your class. Shinzo Hitoshi will be taking his place. Shota wanted to call bullshit. He wanted to shake the little animal until he got the truth. He did neither of those things. Nezu, if I find out that Midori has been harmed in any way because of this situation, I will personally bring your furry ass to court. Aizawa, I will remind you that I happen to be your superior. Nezu's cheerful demeanor darkened for a split second. If Shota had not been trained to pick up on the smallest changes, he would have completely missed it. It would do you well to remember that. Shoda glared hard enough for the creature to understand he did not believe him, and then he turned and swept from the room. Bakugo knew what was going on, but would say nothing. Nezu knew what was going on, but was lying and would try and sweep Midori's disappearance under the rug by replacing him with Shinso. Shoda growled, hands clenching in his pockets as he strode toward the dorms. The directory was in his desk drawer. If he could get Midori's home phone, perhaps he could get some real answers or at least make sure the kid was all right. He sprinted across the lawn, using his capture weapon to propel him forward. He bypassed the stairs by simply scaling up the side of the building and entering his balcony. He successfully disturbed the cats as he threw open the balcony doors and raced through the kitchen. He was halfway to his desk when his name caught his eye. There, sitting on the coffee table, was the letter. His name was scrawled across the envelope in Midori Izuku's handwriting. His heart dropped to his feet.
with the care he would express toward holding an infant, showed a stoop to pick up the letter. He collapsed on the couch, holding the envelope in his trembling fingers. He traced the letters of his name and swallowed. He had left a letter. Izuku was saying goodbye. Aizawa was not a crier. He avoided expressing emotion as much as possible, yet here, holding the farewell of his beloved student, the edges of his gaze stung and his vision blurred. He opened the letter, praying that the problem child's information would shed light on the muddled mess he had found himself in. However, two words into the first line, and he broke. Sensei, thank you. Shota pulled his gaze away and covered his eyes. Those words had many times brought him joy. Whenever a student graduated or he complimented them on a new move, whenever one of his kids ranked high in a subject they struggled in or when a civilian showed gratitude when he saved their life. Now, though, they meant a completely different thing. Midoriya wrote them as a goodbye, a fond farewell. They were a conglomeration of all the thanks that he felt for every single thing that Aizawa had done. It was an acknowledgement of all the progress that he credited to his teacher. It was the adoration of a child to his hero. Shota did not think he deserved it. I am writing this in hopes that you don't step on it your first foot in the door when you return and trample it into a, a crumpled ball of paper. I'm not sure if you will read it, but if you do, please know that the things you have taught me will be cherished forever. I am indebted to you, Sensei. You have saved my life in more ways than one. You have taught me the true strength of a hero is not in his quirk, but in his heart. Compassion, gentleness, grace. I used to think those traits were weak or undesirable for a hero. Then I met you, and you risked your life for ours during the USJ attack. You got caught on into therapy. You made sure that Todoroki did not have to go home on breaks. You took care of your students without reservation, without discrimination. I did not know that teachers did that. Your kindness has shaped my career at UA more than you know. I'm so honored to have been your student. I know that you all have questions. I know that you'll be angry or disappointed in me. And Shota had to stop and turn away again. His stomach flipped at the image his brain provided of Midoriya writing this. Seated at his desk, hunched over, worrying his lip in anxiety at the thought of his sensei being upset at his departure, Shota wished he could hug him and tell him that he was wrong. Yes, he was upset, but not because Midoriya had dropped or seemed to have fled like a coward. His heart hurt because his prom child was gone, and he could not find him. He had left, and Shota had no idea how much room his student took up in his heart until he was not around to fill it. Problem child. But I have become unfit to attend UA any longer. UA is a school for children worthy of becoming heroes. That's not me. I was foolish to think that I could belong here. I tried. But I'm really good at not trying hard enough, I guess. Life's taught me that. If you have questions, Nezu should be able to explain it. Take care of my class, okay? I know you care about them more than you'll ever say. And they care a lot about you, too. I know I do. Make sure that Katon doesn't skip therapy, and make sure that he does not let this change him. I don't know how he'll react, but we've come a long way, him and I, and I don't want him to be damaged because of my mistakes. Look out for Uraraka. Don't let her aspirations of money outweigh the need for goodness. Make sure Ida learns to laugh. I think he's carrying a weight that none of us know, and humor has always been the best reliever. Help Todoroki realize that his father is trying. Forgiveness is the hardest thing that any of us will ever have to do. An endeavor does not deserve it, but he is trying. Redemption is a long road. Don't let Kirishima lose his tenderness in his quest for strength. He is one of the kindest people I have ever met. It would be one of the world's greatest losses if he were to trade his heart for the fortitude of stone. Kaminari has such a smart mind. Don't let him stew in his doubt. He is capable of great things. Saro fakes a smile and uses jokes to deflate his inner demons. Help him fight them. With each new student, Shota learned a little more about his class. Midoriya, ever the analytic and genius, listed his peers with the utmost affection, asking him to help in ways that he was not able to. Each name and tidbit of information only made the teacher's heartache deeper. The problem child had always worn his love and his smile. He did not know how much he would miss it. I am so grateful that this is one of the hardest goodbyes. You've cared about me in a small way that will change my life in a greater way. I'm just really thankful. If I could do it all again, knowing that I would fail in the end, I would. I've been blessed in so many ways because of you and the lessons you have taught me. Knowing what I would have to lose is still less than the knowledge and experiences you have given me. I hope that when you look back on this crazy class, 
what we put you through, you can say the same. Take care of them, Sensei. And take care of yourself. You deserve to be happy. Please inform Eri that she is the greatest little sister anyone could ask for. Tell her that, no matter what, Deku believes in her. I hope our paths cross again, Sensei. Thank you for it all. It's been a pleasure. Goodbye. Problem child. Tears unbidden and stinging streamed down Shota's cheeks. He could barely feel them over the pain that throbbed in his chest. There were no answers, no explanations. He had hoped for a reason, but all he received were the honest words of the greatest kid he had ever known. The demeaning words that Midori wrote about himself only caused him more hurt. A whine escaped his tight lips, and he dropped the letter onto the table. His hands shook with a fury he could not reason through. Someone had messed with his kid. Someone had taken something from him, torn apart his dream of being a hero. He had lost something, something so vital and important that he deemed himself unfit to stay. Someone had hurt him. Someone had made him leave. Shota curled up on his sofa, palm shoved into his eyes, and he sobbed. All right, listeners. This concludes Chapter 3 of Prodigal. Chapter 4 will be next. I hope you all are enjoying this fic so far, and as always, thank you so much for listening.